Hello, and welcome to Farming Matters. I am your host, Erin Schneider. I work with the North Central SEER program, and I also farm, and I'm here with you from Wisconsin. I'm also here with Marie Flanagan, um, Hello. producer of Farming Matters, and Mimi Kokoska is going to take you to her farm and tell us about her project and what she learned from her SEER grant and to demystify what are truffles and what is she discovering along the way. So Mimi, thank you for joining us. I'm going to toss it over to you, and we look forward to learning about your SEER grant. Thank you, Erin. I'm Mimi Kokoska. I'm an actual physician surgeon by background. Uh, I became interested in farming uh, really earlier in life. However, really had the opportunity to um, purchase land that we've been working on. And it was natural in many ways for us to pivot from the standard uh, crops uh, such as soy and corn uh, in the agricultural acreage that we have in Indiana to include truffles, uh, so truffle inoculated trees to be specific. So what the slide shows is on the left is the surface type fungi or fungus that we're accustomed to. So mushrooms, we see morels and uh, relatively size of those morels that uh, many individuals are aware of and have tasted and are almost obsessed with in Indiana, in the Midwest. And then we see shiitakes that are grown on logs there uh, on the upper um, right on the left side of the screen, which is a surface, obviously, mushroom, fungus, and then the golden oysters. So those are examples of surface fungi or fungus. And so we're I, really familiar with those. However, subterranean fungi uh, is a, a good example, of course, are truffles, and they grow underground. So you can't see them usually when you're walking through the woods or wherever. And hmm, that's what they look like on the right-hand side. Uh, these clumps, if you will. And these are specifically what you see there are white truffles, the most highly valued <laughs> truffles um, in the world. And it shows a good example is the uh, partner, if you will, and uh, that it grows along with, and that is a tree. Uh, in this case, it's a hazelnut tree there. And it grows underground. And uh, that that is the good and the challenge, if you will, of truffles. Uh, how do you find them if they're underground? Um, and to get them to grow in our climate, our growth zone, given uh, the cold winters that we have, is uh, part of the challenge as well. So I will share with you, uh, here's an example of the tuber magnetum on the left, that's the white truffle, and the tuber melanosporum, the black um, truffle, if you will, on the right. And these are just examples to wet your palate, so to speak, on how I've actually eaten truffles. These are examples of truffles I've actually had. So uh, fortunate for me, I've been able to sample all these. And this is what uh, really spurred our pursuit. The, and I mentioned earlier, the truffles really stimulate all your senses and from your smell to taste, touch. Um, so uh, this is an example of the, one of the challenges that we experience is in agricultural soils, and soil is so important for farming, of course, and the quality of that soil, but um, the pH in this case, uh, because it had been historically farmed for many, many decades in traditional farming, the pH tends to be quite acidic. And if, let's just say seven, pH of seven is, is neutral, um, the pH here we can see on the screen shows the soil samples that we took were 6.5 and 6.7. And this in July 7th was 6.9 and 6.6, .6, approximately the time that we applied lime. And we're talking lots of lime, um, tons and tons of lime per acre. So that's a challenge. And this is just an example of what it looked like with the field as we were prepping it. And before planting the following spring. So we also um, applied um, some straw and uh, prior to disking it into the soil with the lime. And we also had some cover crops in the field to add organic matter and improve the quality of that soil. And this is all before even planting the truffle inoculated trees. So as you can see a lot of work. 
So these are just examples of cover crops and a list of some of the cover crops that we applied. And we also uh, develop leaf compost. And this is all in preparation, again, for our spring planting the following year. And a crude but important diagram on the left is uh, just shows the planting distances between each inoculated tree to plan and the density matters. So because the canopy of the trees, if the earlier that closes the canopy and um, by its uh, branches and leaves, the higher likelihood of truffle growth um, because of the canopy. And then of course, machinery. And when we're planting, planting the plant um, over a thousand, well, we ended up with 1,350 trees um, digging the holes, um, we use the mechanical auger here. So this just shows an example of our system and digging the hole, then planting a tree, putting a, a um, five foot high cover on it and attaching it. And here's an example of the real deal <laughs> with our dog. No, that is not a truffle dog. That is a livestock guardian dog. And I think we're teaching him to um, guard the tubes, trees. And um, it was it was cold uh, because we planted at the toward the end of March of 2022. So cold and wet out there. And those are the tree tubes, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and we really had a, a pretty good success rate. And that was what the counter was showing there. And we about a month afterwards, we estimate less than 3% loss of the trees. So, so here is the pH, nine months post slime, and we can see the pH has improved. Here it's raised now to seven and 7.3. The cation exchange capacity has improved as well. It's much higher and, um, and I point out the calcium as well. So one of the challenges that we met was really rainfall. <laughs> All of the challenges. And so I'm sharing with you here the uh, NOAA, if you will, uh, the precipitation. And I use Indianapolis as a similar latitude because our farming town is um, small enough that it really doesn't track it um, consistently. So I just used uh, the same latitude in Indiana for this. And it really shows that when we planted in 2022, this row down here, just shows the, in March, there, it was, remember I just said it was really wet and cold indeed. So if we look across the last 10 years, almost, it, it was one of the higher rainfalls. And then we come to June and it's in red circled because it was dry. We go back pretty much 10 years, it's one of the lowest in rainfall. So ergo the challenge for us, because these were seedlings, uh, really fragile in, in that sense. So we go to the end of the year, we just see the end of the year total is low relative to the prior 10 years as well. So what did we do? This is a picture of the well. So uh, fortunately in our community, uh, we have somebody who uh, puts in wells. So um, he came and installed it and here we go. This is the system that we used for providing water hydration to our poor little seedlings. And that's how we that's how we dealt with it. So this also shows the, another challenge, and this is a Google map of a weed, an invasive weed called cocklebur, and we could see where Indiana is here, and there's a lot of cockleburs, pretty dense. It's not as bad as some other areas. So this, we had to do weed management or outside the tubes. And then also there were some inside the tubes. I'm gonna show a picture. And then we use the leaf compost I showed you earlier to provide a, a zone, if you will, of coverage and, and moisture. So I'll show you a, a picture of those cockleburs uh, later, but here's another example of a thread. Um, so or a challenge that we faced. Um, so you may think, well, why did we tube the, the trees? So for any deer hunters out there or uh, deer experts, wildlife experts, we see uh, deer tracks as well as the scat. 
and, and deer tend to rub and really eat as well um, the new stems and, and trees and damage and kill them. So it really could reduce the success rate. And this is our livestock guardian dog being very protective of the trees. So we talked about cover crop on the, on the left um, and we use that, but some of the cover crop also can get into the tubes. And so we had to um, remove some of those from inside the tubes and then replace the, uh, replace the tubes. The other thing is bent tubes was a challenge from the wind. And you can see that here. So we could, and fortunately at that time, the trees were small enough or short enough that it really didn't affect the trees if we could catch it and then upright it. And we learned a few things. The higher the, there's a balance, but the higher we could put the stakes and the tubes, secure the tubes, the less likely it'll bend. So, uh, but the stakes also have to go into the ground far enough to be secure. So there's the, the balance. Here you go, a little straighter, better posture on those tubes. And we could see through the seasons, the, the green leaves um, behave like they would for oaks and turn brown, if you will, in the fall and through the, the winter. So, so the truffles actually need to be inoculated into the trees. So we um, acquired truffle inoculated trees, saplings, and planted those. So it, it, they grow in conjunction with each other through the years. So it takes somewhere between, it could be a little shorter than six years. It could be as long as I've heard 20 years before somebody can find truffles on their inoculated uh, trees. So, so the cocklebur, remember I showed you the Google map with the distribution in the United States. Well, this was our joy to have these cocklebirs, not really, uh, <laughs> grow, grow. And the cocklebirs are very difficult, if you will, to work with because they they truly, to their name, they perform these, I mean, they um, produce these burrs and they stick onto the dog's fur. Uh, they hurt your fingers if you don't have uh, thick gloves on. And the benefit, the strategy, however, is for farming in general, you don't see them quite as much in farmed land agricultural cropland because a lot of farmers will use pre-emergence. They will actually suppress these weeds from growing. Um, of course, when we were transitioning, we did not have pre-emergence or use pre-emergence. And so lo and behold, these things sprouted up, surprise. And um, so a combination of, uh, they will pull out uh, pretty readily and they do not do well in the shade. They um, have a strong preference for full sun. So the idea is, uh, remove the burden, the seed burden over time by removing them early on before they can seed. That's our strategy, as well as um, closing that canopy over time. It will suppress the cocklebirds from growing. So when there is an abundance of truffles, uh, it's a finite lifespan unless they're dehydrated or used in some or preserved in some other way. But really fresh truffles um, have a finite lifespan. And uh, these are just examples of of truffles, like I said, I've been able to partake in and um, in different places. And on the left is actually um, some black truffles that I had uh, here in the United States. So not in Indiana though, <laughs> not yet. I really you know, appreciate all the like the step-by-step -step and like talking about both the challenges and then what well, also the transformation and highlights too, with like, you know, how you're rehabbing the soil and making it supportive of of like hardwood and um, truffle source. When a um, couple questions that people may like other farmers or the growers may like just come to mind. Um, how how did you go about sourcing the, the inoculated trees? Well, um, so I am a member of the Na uh, North American Truffle Growers Association. So that's a good resource. There are a number of growers, not, not I'd, I'd say about a handful of um, truffle inoculated uh, tree growers and distributors, if you will, in the United States. So you wanna focus uh, within the country just because of transport time, mm -hmm. uh, getting them into the soil. And then, you know, becomes, well, who, it's a trust. You have to decide who you're gonna trust. It's a huge investment, mm -hmm. um, financial time, as you can see. So it's a long-term investment and you won't know if you have truffles for many years. So there's a lot of trust in there as to uh, where 
you know, which vendor you may decide to go with. Um, I, I think any of the top vendors would have been fine. Um, there are some nuances in the agreements that one needs to be aware of. Uh, and so that becomes important too. And what are you going to do with your truffles? Um, you know, are there any clauses in those agreements where you might have to disclose or credit or, you know, is there financial impact uh, in that agreement? So that all came into play into how we decided with what, which vendor we went with. So um, was there any other like kind of key lessons or advice you would offer to other farmers who are considering this? You mentioned connecting with the network, but like things that you're like, oh, wow, if I were to start again, I would have done X, Y, Z. Or... I think soil, the uh, significance of soil, quality of soil, mending the soil cannot be um, underrated, uh, if you will, and being very intentional about that. If one has a lot of time uh, to prep that soil, then great, because you can check that by doing soil samples and testing uh, and, and looking at the impact of what you do. The other is just being uh, aware and prepared to um, uh, take care of and um, eliminate any uh, significant weeds. I think that was a, that was one of our like, pop-up surprise. Uh, so uh, I think just being prepared of, and, and one has to really check on the trees, especially in the early uh, stages, as you saw some of the bent um, tubes and really uh, learning from that. Wow, Mimi, thank you for just like helping share just like all the steps and like opening our eyes to like and something like, oh yeah, we can grow this, right? But then I'm like, wait a minute, let's pause. There's a lot of research and a lot of a lot of thought and intention and investment that went into your project. Yeah, thank you. So I'm this I'm a geek. Um, so I tend to I, I really I am so uh, but but I really do enjoy um sharing that, sharing sharing really everything, right? So uh and experience. So I, I really would love, love to do this in person and let you sample some of the things that are unique to our area.